Okay, I think I'm gonna call tonight's meeting to order, seven o'clock. Um, so um, I'll just start by making our usual uh, comment that the meeting is being recorded. In fact, it's being videotaped and that you're also welcome to make your own recording, but if so, let us know just so that we ensure that you aren't gonna disrupt the meeting with your setup. Okay, so uh, tonight we have one agenda item that's a scheduled item and then a bunch of other committee business, but uh, I'm just gonna start off with that item, which is the recommendation to the Zoning <coughs> Board of Appeals. Uh, which is for the application of the Concord Free Public Library for a special permit and site plan review um, under various sections of our zoning bylaw for the partial demolition of the existing house, construction of a new addition, interior renovations, new accessible pedestrian entrance and site improvements at their property at uh, 129 and 151 Main Street. So, do we have uh, a representative of the applicant to Brief speak? Introduction, I'm sure. Jeff Adams. I'm a trustee with the Concord Free Public Library. And with me tonight is Carrie Cronin, the director of the library, and Chris, from our civil engineer from GGD, and Stu and Michael from Johnson Roberts, our architects. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. We're really quite excited about this. And I, I guess I'll just offer a little bit of background that We've been looking at this project for four or five years. We're very fortunate to be able to purchase the adjacent property and then spent about two years having meetings with the community and asking patrons, what doesn't work well at the library? What would you like to see improve? And the organization of the project, the addition to the library, connecting these two buildings is a direct outcome of that feedback. So uh, we're looking forward to presenting tonight. And I'll turn it over to Chris. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can just use this. Nope. You can. Stuff or are you, you can. Project? You can. Uh, you can do either. This. It, well, so it's being videotaped, so a projector will be easier if you want to use okay. that. Okay. Yeah. It's a little silver button. Other way. There you go. Um, again, Christopher Garcia with Garcia Golasco de Souza with civil engineers for the project. Um, I don't know if we can. The, uh, this is the um, site survey of the pro uh, of the site. Uh, the existing library building located here, um, and then the existing residence. Um, the existing residence has a gravel drive. Um, there's also an adjacent gravel drive for the library here on site. Um, there's no other permanent parking on the site of the library. Um, there's pathways um, to the building here. There's a mechanical enclosure or mechanical area with existing mechanical equipment uh, located in that area. Uh, as mentioned, the buildings are served by um, water, sewer, natural gas, electrical, and some existing stormwater leaching pits uh, that serve the library. Um, I guess we can go to the next drawing. These are just detail sheets of the project um, right here. This is the site demolition plan. Um, as this gray hatch area, these are the two existing gravel drives that will be removed. Um, also, the existing walkways into the residence uh, will be removed. Um, the darker hatch are the portions of the building that is proposed to be removed at the residence. There's a garage area here, uh, a small shed building, and this is the portion of the existing structure that will be demolished. Um, utilities, uh, we intend to, um, Sorry. there's an existing sewer service um, that will be removed that uh, leads to Main Street. Uh, that will be replaced as part of this project uh, once the renovations and additions are, are constructed. If you know I assume that the demolition delay bylaw would not be invoked by no, because kind of they're not process. demolishing the structure. Well, I just wonder about that standalone garage. I, I assume it's 
not I, I okay I don't I think it was built after 1941 but okay. you can check This is, this is not the right one. Actually, is it? an older plan, so I don't know Why if you I can put these in. Um, yeah. So we have one. Oh, there we go. So this is the proposed site plan, layout plan. Um, it's added um, a larger scale than what you had seen on the site uh, survey. So this is just the corner of the existing library building that's existing to remain. Uh, this white area is the existing portion of the residence that will remain. Um, this hashed area is the building addition that will uh, adjoining the existing library to the new residence. Um, as shown, there's going to be pathways and walkways to the building. This is the accessible walkway. Um, they'll be a, maintaining a new uh, dust, uh, stone dust path in that area. Um, and then new walkways in the back. These are all hard surface walkways, patio area. These, uh, this will connect to the existing path next to that uh, existing mechanical area for the library. Uh, and then there will be a small mechanical area here that will house condensing units for the HVAC air conditioning system. That is, will be similar construction as what is at the existing library, slightly depressed area um, to shield the units There'll be an acoustical fence around this enclosure to shield the noise um, made from those uh, condensing units. Typical fan units that you would see kind of in a re residential application, just a little bit more robust to deal with the, uh, the air conditioning systems. So as part of the uh, accessibility upgrades, we intend to create two accessible parallel parking spots on Main Street. Um, so we've realigned the curve slightly to come in to the south to allow for parallel parking and then allowing for an exist, uh, accessible uh, striped area, um, you know, obviously to get allow the passengers to get out of the vehicles. The northern edge of that striped area aligns with the outer edge of the existing parking and striping area there for the parallel parking that's already on Main Street. Uh, so this allows for an accessible path to the existing building. I, I'm sorry, to the new addition. This is an accessible path. This is not an accessible path because that's an existing step up into the uh, library building. So that's not an accessible path. Um, so again, it's realignment of the curb, the granite curb that goes back in, and a slight realignment of that existing concrete walkway to allow for, for parking. In terms of utilities, <clears throat> one of the main major utilities that we need to, uh, or one of new utilities is electrical. Um, I'm sorry, I did not point that out on the existing survey, but the transformer is located in this area and it's actually fed from Main Street. So that electrical service will be uh, redone and actually come from Sudbury, which is shown in this park plan which is the south corner of the site. If you can see, this is that existing corner of the library building there. So it's just the park plan due to the scale. So that transformer is going to be located down in Sudbury, near Sudbury, and a new service will be brought in to the building uh, for electrical power. Uh, as I mentioned, there'll be a new, we will relay the sanitary service for the um, residents, uh, renovated residents, that'll be a new sanitary line. Uh, existing fire and water services are going to remain. We're going to the existing library is protected with an automatic sprinkler system. That's going to be extended through our connecting addition um, to feed sprinklers in the residence in the addition. Uh, and then we also have some planned storm drainage. Um, again, because we have limited area. There'll be subsurface structures below ground um, that will collect all of the roof runoff and 
and surrounding areas we have a series of catch basins or drain inlets that are going to collect uh, the water uh, from ground and also from the roof and direct that to two areas that'll infiltrate the storm water into the ground similar approach that we had done in, in the past years for the original uh, library construction uh, we sent that information hopefully you received that drainage report and i know uh, town engineering is going to be reviewing that that was part of the review comments um, and then there would be some site lighting just at the sidewalks that would be bollard kind of bollard style lighting there's no parking on site so we don't have any high um, lighting poles so uh, the threat of, of light uh, passing over the property line is not not present <coughs> it's designed um, will there be lights along where the accessible parking is uh, the lighting will start essentially at the sidewalk okay here that sidewalk intersection and then new lights within the property here on the sidewalk and then on the rear uh, in that patio <coughs> area that uh, right and there's street areas. lamps along the road yes those would be existing to remain um so that's essentially the site utility plan um so basically the existing impervious cover is approximately twenty eight thousand five hundred square feet due to the uh new addition and the, and the proposed improvements on site we are going to increase uh, the impervious cover to uh, just under 35,000 uh, square feet uh, so there's approximately about a 6,000 square foot increase in impervious cover but we're providing the new drainage to deal with that um, in, increase in impervious cover to infiltrate the storm water into the ground um, in terms of um, all setbacks we're meeting all setbacks with a new uh, addition um, the existing porch is 16 and a half feet um, set back to the property line that's an existing condition that we don't uh, you know, not performing that it's existing to remain uh, other than that we meet all the uh, setbacks um, we meet the cover and the area um, calculations that are required for the project um, if you go to the landscaping yeah. Yeah. Might be sure yeah so our landscape architect is on vacation this week so uh, speak this the best we can um, so uh, out here in the front there's an existing uh, big yellow wood tree um, we're keeping that um, and then we're going to infill some plantings along the perimeter of the existing building down low under that have a new lawn here that will um, kind of be in a similar relatively lawn that's at the separate road entrance to the library and there's going to be some new trees uh, that will go up around that as well as some low plantings um, again there's going to be some plantings over here and then uh, we are adding to there are some tree existing trees along this is um, this is a little confusing it's flipped Right, uh, from the from previous the one. Yeah, yeah. That's that's right. so this is up is south here, so. Just um, where's Main Street? Can you just. Oh, sorry, Main Street is down here. Oh, down. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, so, Thanks. And, yeah. so Main Street's down here. This is north, uh, and the south side is up here. So Great. along the western property line here, we are keeping some trees. We're taking um, some down for fire access, and then some trees that are too close to the building. Um, and then we're infilling some new trees to provide a, a screening uh, planting buffer. Uh, we're doing a similar thing in this back corner and along the back, um, the north, excuse me, the south property line, uh, where we're keeping uh, a large number of the existing trees and then infilling uh, with new trees as a planting buffer. And uh, that's that's the line short of the the landscape plan. Unless there's any questions about it. Well, I just wondered, uh, I mean, what are you taking down? You, you said that there are a few trees that are too close to the house, but yeah. I mean, anything significant? No, there's, uh, there are a few, there's a uh, relatively large the tree back here. But, oh, sorry. Okay. Well, the, I think you're... Oh, it's, it's listed yeah, if you go back, yeah, yeah, to, the yeah, the demo plan, you can see, yeah, right here is great thing. So this, um, this is showing there's a number of trees in this area, which are mostly, um, lots of their... White pines. Uh, yeah, white pines, yeah. So those are 
really closer together and very close to the house um, okay. and impeding yeah. on fire access okay. and they're just not in great shape. Similarly, these ones over here, I believe, are mostly white pines and are and some spruce, yeah, and are, and are again, very close to the house. Um, and then it, there's a, a Norway maple here, so an invasive species. Yeah. Uh, so it's mostly that sort of thing. There's not anything that um, that is really a, a, okay. a tree that's in good shape that we're we're taking down. And we're being careful, um, you know, in this area, and again, um, further down to the south to maintain on the trees that we've raised, except yeah. that we can on the property lines. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we want to get back to the landscape plan or if there's anything else we want to touch on there. Or... I think that was it for the okay. landscape. Yeah, I mean, unless there's something more you wanted to present. No, I think that that's, that's okay. the gist of it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, is there a list of species? There are, yeah. So if you, sorry. Oh, sure. Uh, so back. it's right there. I yeah. Guess. It's, yeah. Um, oh, or, it's it's uh, hard to read here, but, um, but okay. yeah, this, this is the species list, and then they're all tagged. Um, okay. Great. In the landscape. We'll, we'll review that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Great, thanks. Um, so we're going to see any. I Elevations? Think, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's sorry, actually, I'm yeah, keep going down. Would be helpful if somebody addresses the relief for parking. Sure. Um, did you want to run through the floor plan real quick? Sure, we can do the, yeah, yeah, yeah whatever, yeah, whatever helpful. order you're, we're happy to go through it. Yeah, this, this is just showing, this um, is really an interior lighting plan, but we're just showing there's a few, um, so there's a few exterior lights. Um, at the entrances, so that's why we've included this. Uh, they don't show up on the, the site lighting plan. Uh, and again, those are low. Um, the only one that's uh, is going to be a, an overhead light is at the existing porch of the house. So the rest are going to be low, sort of step lights. Um, so this is the basement plan, the existing library uh, in this area, the existing house in this area. We're not doing a whole lot at the basement level, um, except that we're you know redoing a few things in the special collections area. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of basement storage, uh, and we're looking now into um, possibly doing an expansion of the vault, uh, the archive vault that's in the special collections, as well as the workroom. Uh, and then this is that uh, sunken area that Chris mentioned where the um, mechanical equipment will go on the rear side. Okay. And then the rest of it um, you know, this is all unexcavated um, in this area. Uh, at the upper, this is the ground floor, so this is the Sudbury Road entrance, this is the entrance if you're coming from um, the village. And we're taking, right now, this is the, the children's library office that's going to come out so that we can create a, a connection through here. The existing children's library will become a forum, so a large meeting room, uh, which is something the library lacks now. Uh, this will connect from, the, the opening from the existing library building will connect into an area um, it's a common, so it's going to have the periodicals, uh, some gathering space, um, uh, they have copy, and then we've got to uh, navigate the uh, a change in elevation from about four feet eight above the um, of the floor here at this ground level is about four foot eight above the ground level of the house. So we have a ramp that wraps around, uh, as well as some stairs, some seating uh, that will bring you down to this is the the new children's apartment. An activity room, uh, toilets, and office for the children's apartment, and then again from this area at the bottom of the stairs and the ramp, you can come down this um, walkway here. This is the entrance that will be from Main Street, uh, so Main Street's down here. Uh, we'll come along a new uh, hallway, and then this is when you're in the uh, existing house. There's a workshop, sort of a maker space, uh, media lab, um, and these are spaces that are all tied along the back. And then um, this is, we're back into the children's wing back here, uh, a few additional toilets. So architecturally, I mean, I, the old house will sort of read as a facade, and yet the entrance is back 
along the back. How are you dealing with that from a design point of view to kind of give people cues as sure. to how they're going to enter this building? Yeah, so and maybe we can go to the elevation. So um, I think part of it will be one thing is that we're taking off the walkway to the existing sure, house to help. But but I mean, it's still gonna, you're gonna retain the facade yeah. of the house. It's we will, yes, be... yeah. So you'll have, um, so if you don't mind scrolling back up a little. Um, so this will be the entrance, it will be set back. It's a little, um, things a little easier to read and we can send a rendering if that's helpful. Ahead of the we have meeting. one. Um, yeah. But this is a rendering of it, because I can pass this one. Uh, does that have a... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd like to see it. There we go, yeah. That's much better than the old Yeah. No, I was just surprised it wouldn't in our packet or... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it still feels like a house here. Well, yeah, that, that's what we're... Well, and it needs it. to. Yeah. It needs to, but then you can't enter it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's actually important while we noted that on 151 there are a couple of other doors they're not public entrances so the emergency egress only so the front door is effectively locked at the building although it's it's a fire yeah egress, mm -hmm. as well as um an exit at staircase on the west side of the building so the only public entrance that's being added is the accessible entrance at the north side right it and just seems a little weird yeah, well, the goal of the project was to maintain the identity of the two buildings. The right. 1790 Haywood Benjamin House, the 1934 Crypto, which yeah. by Harry Little. So we, we think that does that. Okay. Yeah, we're, now, we're trying to make downplay the entrance while obviously making it visible. So that's, it, that's, it's the, a that's trick. the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the reason why, you know, this. This door is going to be fixed shut, and we'll have no steps, or excuse me, no walkway to it. This door will also have no walkway to it. This one, which is a, an accessible means of egress, will have that stone dust path out to the street. And the thinking there being that with the stone dust, it you know, implies that it's not really a main entrance. Right. I just, whenever I've seen sort of a setback modern entrance that's superimposed on a, some historic structures, you know, to draw people to it, typically there's kind of like a plaza or some other yeah. external feature that kind of says, this is it, this is where you come in, you know, or something. I, yeah, well, we're hoping, we're hoping the walkway and the lawn uh, with some seating around it will, will draw people in uh, to that entrance as opposed to you know, trying to get into the house. And then, I, I don't know, maybe this is a little bit out of order, but I had heard in the chair's breakfast that um, there apparently was still some feedback to be incorporated from the HDC. I mean, I guess you're meeting with them next August 1st, but I, is there a risk that this design is going to be changed significantly? Well, we, we had had a meeting scheduled um, this past week, and then the meeting ended up being canceled. Um, so that's why we're, before you're a little out of order, but the, the intention is that we will, you know, come back once we have the uh, certificate of appropriateness. Yeah. So. Um, it's just that it, it sounded like to me, at least in the chair's breakfast, that it wasn't going to be just a rubber stamp. It, it might, there might be some, there's some open issues or something. Sure. So know. one of them, a number of the issues are things that from the last uh, meeting or was that we're addressing, for instance, we had um, uh, some different landscape areas with more um, impervious surfaces and we've gone back and so this plan this, reflects exactly, the yes, proposed this, this, changes exactly this is okay what we, good yeah sorry good. yeah because so that was my big concern we about in, tonight yeah. is like well were we looking at you know what was likely to get built or not no yeah this this reflects what we have submitted to the HEC okay. for um, the next meeting Um, I don't know if, if you want to go back to the, I think the only thing we didn't touch on was the, before we come back here, um, was the upper, the second floor, no. um, and the, sorry. the roof plan, which if we want to just go through that, I, oh, I'm sorry, I could, yeah, this is the second floor, we can just stay, yeah, thanks. So this is, this is the second floor of the house, this is the second floor of the library, we're just setting a couple study rooms up here at the library, there's not a whole lot that's going on here other than some collection 
stuff is moving so around. So what used to be the magazine reading room, what is that hap so, happening to that now? So that's going to be the, the books that are currently stored, uh, housed up here in the atrium. Oh, the forbidden section. Exactly. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be made accessible to the public by being moved to this area. And I think we're going to add some uh, large print and some it's other... It's especially great that it's like religion it, books. And, yeah, and self-help. Self-philosophy. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so we're going to make the, the intent is to make that um, more certainly more accessible to uh, everybody in the public, and that uh, some of the I believe the original collections that are stored in the basement will now be moving up. So oh, good! I was going to wonder if you were going to buy books by the foot or something. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the story of the no, it'll be uh, the, so it'll be a nice. Uh, uh, ability to you know house and, and display the original collections great, great. Uh, uh, in a way that they're still protected. It's um, magnificent, so it so absolutely it. has to. Yeah. And then the uh, the upper level of the house. This is almost entirely um, existing piece of the house. There's a little bit that's open to below here that's under the bridge, and the staircase is new. Uh, but this is for the most part going to be offices that are currently housed in the uh, lower level of the library building as well as a few study rooms and, and that's and this is a there's a, a courtyard now in the house uh, and that's going to become a, a more of a workshop maker space room so this will be a, a double height space for that to get some borrowed light into these uh, single floor spaces. So this back is a kind of an atrium area? I mean, uh, that this, sorry. so where the children's section is, is an extra height? There's one area, um, this is, if you, sorry, uh, if you don't mind going back to nope. the what do you uh, need? Uh, If you go back one page. Just trying to see if there's any kind of interior So this is, it's this area I'm here. curious what. Sorry. Yeah. It's this area here in yeah. the children's area. And basically it's where, Extending the the roof line of this piece of the, this L of the house yeah. back, and so that's going to end up having a, a double height space there. It's not going to be completely double height because the the floors of the house are you know a lot lower than what we would have for a yeah. commercial structure, but it'll be right. a bit of a raised area there, and similarly <clears throat> over this workshop. Okay. So is there a, a rendering from the other side? I didn't yeah, see. Yeah, I think you'll see them. This is the closest thing. Yeah. Yeah. The renderings. Yeah. Submitted. Uh, they're submitted for the store districts. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. So they weren't submitted to the CBA. No. It, I don't know if it's possible to bring them up or. Are they on the? They should. Be, yeah. They're the ones that we sent over uh, for the last meeting. What's the total increase in gross square footage? The total increase, I oh, don't see. I don't have it off the top of my head, but. Or, or even percentage wise, I'm just Yeah, wondering. let me just grab the number. So we are going from. Uh, we're adding, once you subtract the, the portion of the house that's uh, to be demolished, it's about 6,500 square feet net increase. And the existing library is about? Uh, 58,000. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the existing is 51,500, and we're going to 58,000 for, for the combined building. Got it. Thanks. Oh, even with the footprint of the existing house, you're only right. adding six out there. Yeah, well, we're taking 7,000 square feet. There's a decent amount of um, traction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. A, a, more recent additions uh, on the back side of the house. Gosh, it feels like a much bigger it does, addition. It does. Yeah. yeah. Is that quite right? Could it be? It, just, yeah, it, it looks looks bigger than that, but you know. I the demolition. Yeah, I think yeah. once you look at what the. Well, I'm just looking at the rent. Isn't this all yeah. a building? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just if you look at the, the footprint that's coming okay. on. So I'm, I'm just going to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. We need one person talking at a time, sorry. and the board gets to talk oh, first. Yeah. <laughs> So it's one story though in the back. Maybe that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's what's affecting this. I'm thinking like yeah. volumetrically, you know, the whole thing. Because if you look at the footprint yeah. of the building, the footprint is ex extending quite a bit, right? In fact, I think you were talking about imp uh, the right. impervious surface area increases almost as much as your square footage increase. Yeah, it's a, like, you know, pretty know. much, which is kind of surprising. That's very rare. Yeah. Well, yeah. When we don't, when the uh, the lack of par you know, there's no parking, um, we'll get to. Uh, so that obviously takes off a lot of the impervious surface. But if you 
um, if you go to the next um, slide, I wonder if it shows the outline of the existing underneath. Uh, nope. Unfortunately, it doesn't, but. There's one. There was you one have, that, yeah, right, right, right here. This it. shows the old footprint superimposed, yeah. Um, there. Yeah. yeah. There, yeah. So you can see what we're talking about adding is, you know, really this area in here, you know, a little over here as well. Um, right, and then that garage is outside of the yeah. footprint, so it's actually total subtraction. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Did you say that you made a change <clears throat> to um, accommodate the HTC that resulted in less impervious surface? We did. Yes. And what can you just say what that change sure. was? Uh, so we had had a space out here for three um, accessible parking spaces and van parking, mm -hmm. um, and and obviously a driveway to get to those. So taking that out, um, I don't have the numbers in front of me. That's but okay. That, that was a, the the you biggest see it? part of our. No, that's okay. Oh. Um, and it's it's being replaced with landscaping. Correct. Nice. Okay. I don't know if we want to go back to the elevations, if there was anything else to... Maybe, maybe talk. when we've got one of the plan um, views. Uh, so, this this area looks like it's generally sort of in the style of this house with a couple of glass sections in between, is that right? That's correct. And so not a lot of windows along that wall. Uh, correct. We're, if we want to go to the um, elevation, we might have a rendering looking down that side as well. These, um, yep. these are no, that's yeah. that yeah. so th these are a little yeah, these renderings are a little older, but this is largely unchanged other than the um, paint color. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have these windows. This isn't showing the, the recess windows are window there and there. Yeah. Correct. And then so and then on the back curve, that's <coughs> all glass. Do you have a sense of the the programming? I'm, I'm just wondering about light activity in the evenings neighbors uh, for that back wall of class. Thank you for that question. Um, and that's come up with the HDC as well. We just scrolled past a night vision. So the library corporation is committed on the south and the west and the north side to install screens that are light blocking screens, effectively 90% of the light that's submitted will go down on timers at dusk um, <coughs> during, the, during the evenings to control light emission towards the adjacent neighbors. There are two properties on Sudbury Road and a couple on Academy Lane on the west side of the property. And um, the discussion has been to have shades that automatically go down in the evening. Okay. And and from that, do you have do you know the distance from those windows to the adjacent the house that's behind there? Uh, I don't know the exact number. If we want to go to the um, any of the site plans we can look at but we're yeah, so these windows are obviously all along here. Mm -hmm. um, so they, the setback, I don't know if this one shows the setback, but the, we get the 30, um, thank you. So this closest point is, you know, a little more than 30 feet okay. to the property line. Uh, these windows are mostly uh, shielded from this side. Uh, obviously, you know, from this side, they're, they're visible. They're mostly shielded by you know, this, this portion of the building. I, I will point out the actual required setback is 15 feet as a corner lot. Okay. So not, not 30 feet. Okay. And it looks, eyeballing it, I guess it's 50 to 60 feet to the corner of that, that adjacent house. Right. Just looking at the GIS. <clears throat> Any other discussion by the board at this um, stage? Yeah, if so I let's get yours. One more yeah. item, and I am not a traffic consultant. I'll just preface that, but there was a traffic uh, consultant on board. Uh, as part of the application, we are asking for relief for on-site parking. Yeah. Um, I think um, the existing library as it is would require 168 parking spaces. Um, the added area um, requires an additional 64 parking spaces, uh, but the, the traffic consultant, I believe this memo had been issued uh, to the board, 
um, had studied that and, and there's adequate uh, parking, public parking, you know, within a five minute walk uh, to the facility. So that's why we're asking for relief. We're not asking for relief because we think the book bylaw is incorrect, but um, just due to the fact that we have no um, you know, on site um, parking area involved, but uh, according to the study, there's adequate public parking uh, within the facility. So that's why we're asking. Yeah, now when we reviewed the uh, Emerson extensions that just went up, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the shared parking lot, and I think there's a shared parking agreement mm -hmm. around that lot, and there have been discussions about reconfiguring the lot. Um, there also, I assume you're going to have more evening programming here with the, the big space that you've got in the meeting space. and. So it, it seems like there's more potential for conflicts. I just wondered what are the, you know, have, have you had any discussions with the umbrella? What, what's, you know, what's the status of kind of the parking agreement, any revisions and, and, and the parking lot there? What, what's being done with all that? I, I can offer a response to that. Okay. Uh, we have had a meeting with town planner and uh, uh, town manager for shared for MOU on the municipal parking lot, yeah. indicating that we'll have a shared calendar. And we've actually already had that in place. So there haven't been any conflicts over the last few years with the increased activities of both the Umbrella and Concord Academy and the library, because mm -hmm. there is a good level of communication. But we're ratifying that, confirming it with an electronic calendar. It's interesting though that this change to the library will allow more afternoon programs. Now the only programs that we can have at the library, a lecture or a book reading or a, a group over 25 people, has to be in the evening when the library is closed. But the change from the existing children's room into a public meeting space allows more of those activities to take place during the day. Mm -hmm. So folks from the Council of Aging are, are very excited about that opportunity to be able to have opportunities in the afternoon. But we'll maintain and continue the diligence of communicating with Concord Academy and with Emerson Umbrella to avoid any head-on conflicts. There's also shared opportunities. When we do have an evening event, Concord Academy is very gracious and with advance notice of allowing us to park in their spaces mm. as well as the municipal lot. Okay. Um, and then the uh, handicap parking provisions. I mean, I, I assume you have to provide, you know, normally a number of these handicap spots you're providing to. How does that function in the case of this design? The, the municipal so it, lot will provide well, the. It's already a legal non-conforming site because they yeah. don't provide parking. Right. Um, so it this what they're proposing is actually improves that situation. Right. Um, I believe the requirement it has to be within um, a certain distance. Um, what I don't know off the top of my head, and Jeff might know, but I think it's like 300 feet. 300 feet from the entrance, there has to be some accessible parking, which the library is already accommodated from the handicapped parking in the municipal lot. Um, but providing these two additional spaces will actually improve. Yeah, I was just wondering that, like, for the number of square feet that they're adding, what would be the normal number of handicapped spots that would be required? For 232 parking spaces? I don't know. No, so no. Well, I mean, not for the 233 total. This, for the 64 additional, right, how many of those would have to be? See, that's what I just... I don't... I don't there's, there's four handicapped parking spaces um, in the municipal lot that face the library already. Right. Um, and then they're adding these two. two right. So it's six. Yeah. A dumb question. It, but we've got an increase in space that I think we just calculated was about 15%. It was what, 5,200? Uh, an additional 6,500 on 51,500. Okay, so maybe 15%. I'm not a, yeah. I'm not a numbers guy, but what, the parking spaces are jumping by 40% the requirement. How does that calculation work? I'm because, surprised at the at, because at this square a square footage for a residential dwelling doesn't you can have um, a house in town that's ten thousand square right. feet you're only required to have two parking spaces right but if they need one hundred and sixty eight spaces for fifty one hundred uh -huh. fifty one thousand square feet 
And they're adding six thousand. No, so but so they're they're adding they're they're adding significant more space to the library. We're talking about total impervious coverage and total square footage by removing what they're demoing for a residential structure. So par par parking parking doesn't parking is not the same for a residential structure as it is for the library. So for for parking, it's just based on square footage. Yeah, I'm not netting out the what would be a, allowed or required by that. The, I guess, so is this is this six thousand additional square feet not including the the square footage of the house? Um, right. I'm, sorry, I might be able to go, speak. Go ahead. Yeah, please. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. So, um, cool. so the fifty one thousand five hundred is the existing library building and the existing house. The existing library building on its own. Sorry. Oh, the, the oh so this library. explains the whole thing. Oh, so the existing library building on its own is 42,000, give or take, about 42,000 square feet. And then the remainder of that 51,500 is the house. Okay. Okay. And that was a detail I was. That's a, that makes a big difference yeah, just, now. Okay. Yeah. So that's what had confused us. And All right. To add a little bit to the discussion on the handicaps, but. I met with the building inspector and the actual analysis, given that it's non-conforming space on additional accessible spaces required, is a very difficult one to calculate. Mm -hmm. However, in our conversations with the community before we developed these plans, we, had a, we heard numerous times from folks that the library is actually quite difficult to access right now. Yes. If you're in a situation where you're in a wheelchair or on crutches or in a walker, Absolutely. the challenge is to park on Sudbury Road, cross busy Sudbury Road, and walk up a long ramp. It meets code, but it's right. difficult. Right. So one of the primary, primary goals for this project has been to improve accessibility for the entire community. And we think this... Um, walkway with two parking spaces adjacent to the north side is a significant enhancement. It actually also technically adds one more space um, to the parking in downtown for what it's worth because there are no spaces where the two drivers are. I guess you can make the argument that there's two spaces. Um, mm. But one, the handicapped space on the opposite side of the main street will be converted to a standard space. And there will be now two on the library side. Am I correct on that, Elizabeth? Correct. Will the, will the ones on the uh, Main Street side, will they be van accessible or would they just yes, be? Yes, that was the pullout requirement. Okay, well, yeah, that's, that's very good. I mean, I'm looking now at the ADA requirement, you know, for, I mean, if you count the, there's four in the municipal lot, right? But you're going to convert one of them? No, the municipal lot won't change. Okay, the municipal lot has four and then, you know, two out there, you've got six and, you know, that's for like 200 parking spaces six would be the requirement so and i believe with the improvements that the town will be making to the municipal lot they're actually um i believe there's at least one more handicapped space being added towards okay. the umbrella great in that lot yeah so i think that i mean it's it looks in the realm <laughs> is what I, I just was trying to understand what you're proposing okay so we've got engineering, landscape, architecture, parking. Anything else we should be looking at at this stage? I mean, I was wondering, for example, did Public Works, have they reviewed the parking plan? Uh, I mean, the, the curb cut clearly, you're, I mean, you're changing the curb configuration out there. They've looked at that. Uh, it seemed like there's still pending comments back from the engineering department. I mean, there are a number of things we don't have yet. So it's so we're um, uh, engineering will need to review um, the stormwater drainage. But um, given that we're we're talking, it's it's only um, roof basically roof recharge and some minor pavement. Um, they'll review the calculations, just make sure everything's sized appropriately. Um, the building commissioner did not have time to review these plans, um, although he did review the previous plans and there were no significant um, issues or concerns raised. Uh, this will be going to the HDC next Thursday, is that right? Thursday, August 1st. Um, but based on my conversations with uh, my senior planner, um, many of the issues and concerns that were previously raised um, have been addressed in okay. the revised set of plans. Um, the I 
the curb cut, um, I had conversations with the public works director. Um, you know, there were no you know, significant in issues and concerns, but um, the actual change will, um, this change, um, I believe will require uh, some input from the select board and then appropriate permits from um, the engineering division to make sh actual construction detail drawings, make sure that the drainage along the road yeah. um, you know, flows in the right direction. Um, you know, whether they may have to add a, you know, a additional catch basin, those will be minor details um, to the actual physical <clears throat> design. Um, and then I think- Well, um, that construction sequencing plan. So, so we so got really nice ones from, uh, I, I have to say, we got really good ones from Concord Academy and a, and a good one from uh, the Umbrella for their yeah. projects. So you've got competition out there. Well, yeah. not really. <laughs> so. <laughs> so we're using the same group. Okay. In Concord Academy, and CD Floyd is the builder. Yeah. We've developed those plans for both the Umbrella and CA. And yeah. And for us, we're currently working with them on that plan. And Concord Academy has graciously allowed us to use the temporary parking mm -hmm. space. Oh, that they, they put project. in, which was a very it nice was, setup. Might have been the only yeah. way we could do this. Yeah. So they, they uh, have offered that opportunity for us during this project, and then they'll restore that as soon as the library yeah. project is done. Okay. So well, what you will likely see, should this board move forward with any type of um, positive recommendation, um, that there will be a condition um, somewhat requiring that um, there be some acknowledgement from Concord Academy regarding the use of that, uh, because from a construction standpoint, um, the umbrella had the same conditions, Concord Academy has had the same conditions, um, that there be no construction worker um, parking on Main Street or in the municipal lot. Yeah. Um, it either has to be accommodated on site or elsewhere. Um, which accommodating on on site will be difficult alone um, with the staging of equipment, the construction trailer, yeah. um, and all of those items. So um, I'm that will be that is a standard condition regarding the construction sequencing and safety plan, um, especially similar to Concord Academy and the umbrella. The safety plan will yeah. be um, a component that town staff will look at right um, very okay. critically. Last small question. Um, you talked before about there being able to in this in the uh, in that area that being able to get a cup of coffee, and uh, it's and there was uh, there was language in here about the health division oh, yeah. concerns about using the kitchen, kitchen. for visitors serving yeah, service. I can offer a quick response to that. We it was encouraged that we um, <coughs> review the agreement that was developed for a similar space at the museum addition. And we have a draft of that language indicating that no food will be prepared on site, that it's only to serve food that's been brought in off site. So we need to complete that memo and submit it to the Board of Health, which we'll do very soon. And, and my, cons my concern isn't so much about the Board of Health's purview on, on determining that, but I'm wondering about trash and, and removal of trash. So if once you bring food onto site, you, you've got a different trash situation. Um, this talks about there being totes for trash and recycling. I'm presuming the library is primarily, you know, recyclables and coming out of there now. Is there any plan in, in changing how the library addresses trash if you're providing food service? That's a good question that we should look into. However, we have periodic events that are catered, um, where catering service brings in, and to the best of my knowledge, for all intents and purposes, leftover food are removed from site. But I think it's a good point that we should address in that memo to the Board of Health on the outside chance. We, we don't want food and stuff filling up trash barrels and left adjacent to 46 Subway Road. Yeah, I mean, these issues, they get hot. You know, we dealt with this in very fine yeah, detail with point. the, with the, yeah. uh, the cafe near a cafe and and I, it, because you're just adja immediately adjacent to re residential areas, of course, they're putting out trash, but it, it could be of a different magnitude. I think it is. It's all day, every day, in their case. But but I I I will clarify that you know the the Concord Museum went down one path, um, and then um, you know, during the discussions with the Board of Health after they received their special permit, um, had to go a, a different path. So um, it's my understanding that if 
you know, a caterer comes in and, you know, uses that kitchen to plate food, pull out the cheese crackers, plate the fruit and serves it that you need a food service permit at that point. And the health code requires, you know, a, a hand dedicated hand wash sink. It requires a steel countertop. It, there are certain requirements. Um, so just because, you know, the, the preparation of food is not the trigger. It's, you know, there's different requirements. So I think between now um, and, you know, should this be continued you know, for the board um, to re review some type of recommendation, they need to sit down with the health director and, um, and understand the food code requirements because um, it, it, it makes a difference. Um, finishing up with my comments from the report, one of those comments was where, you know, currently the plans don't show where all the trash totes are to be located. And um, if this area down on this side is now going to be, you know, a public plaza and people can walk through to this entrance, are all the totes currently, they're all lined up, you know, back here. Um, you know, where where are the totes going to be stored? Are they going to be stored inside this fenced-in area? Um, there, there is some, you know, food waste. I mean, there there's currently a, a small employee, you know, kitchen, mm -hmm. and employees do, you know, have some food. So, um, I, I'm l I'm less concerned with, you know, just, um, you know, one or two events, you know, every few months compared to, you know, as your example, Cafe Nero, which is, you know, every day. Yeah. Is there, now, I'm trying to recall the discussion from town meeting. Is there a, a change in the staffing levels as a consequence of this um, addition being put in? We have our library director here, so I'm going to let Kathy okay. address that. We are anticipating a few additional positions to, to meet the... So be a, a safe area of staff. Children's room will be quite a bit further from the, the current main library. So we are anticipating having two staff members in that space at all times. Um, and then we'll have new maker space. And we are envisioning a position to oversee that new service as well. Because I think, you know, when we looked at parking relief in the past, uh, you know, again, I'm thinking of the example of Cafe Nero. Um, one. We, we treated the parking requirements for staff differently than we did for patrons, essentially, because the staff are potentially there all day mm -hmm. and, you know, consuming a spot that is a high demand spot, uh, potentially. So they they found a way to accommodate their staff is off site parking. And, you know, I again, as you're looking for parking relief here. I just feel like, um, you know, a lot of the same logic is being used here of like, hey, there's plenty of public parking, take a look. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is potentially an, an issue, uh, if, especially if you're increasing staff. I mean, you've got your existing conditions, but if you're increasing staff, um, trying to find a way uh, to accommodate them, uh, at least their parking requirements is uh is key i mean what the cafe nero was i don't did they end up putting the, the bike rack in the basement oh yeah yeah they put a bike rack in the basement all right to to actually encourage employees to to ride to work um you know because again we we do get quite a few complaints about parking availability in concord center i mean increasing numbers where does staff currently park or or are they encouraged to park um, they park in this Stowe Street lot as well as there's some public parking in the Emerson Annex parking lot a little bit further down. And then also on the side streets. The parking's been very limited with all the construction's going on. Yeah. At the umbrella, so it's a variety of places. But I'd say the municipal lot and that additional lot that's shared between the annex and the public parking. Yeah, so... I mean, that's that's a concern that. And then one minor point, staff report, you recommended a second bike rack on this on the new entrance. And I would say condition. <laughs> very, very supportive. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a... 
yeah, I just I just want to be you know consistent in our application of parking requirements. The strategy to park in the Emerson Annex is a good one. It's a little bit further for staff. Yeah, but it is a relief from taking that space. It's not as high as demand area. No, yeah, is is right around the library itself. I mean, there are certainly plenty of times a day where there's plenty of parking right there, but then there are other times where it's tighter. Yeah. And you're not in the dead center of Concord. You're a little off the edge. But I've also heard conflicts that way with, you know, some of the other uses. Okay. Um, uh, should we open up for public comment, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll take some questions from the public. Please identify yourself and your address. Good evening. I'm Sally Sanford, and I live 20 feet from this project at 25 Academy Lane. Okay. In the Agent Smith Carriage House, which is right along the um, west edge right here. Yeah. And because I'm in a non conforming structure, I'm only five feet from the lot line. So I'm very, very close to this project. And I have, I start off with an apology. <laughs> I didn't think that this was going to actually come before you tonight because of the lack of having finished the HDC process. So I have a letter for you, and I didn't get it to you last week. Okay. Um, so I, I apologize, but here this is, and there's a little sort of sketch and attachment. And I'm just not going to read the whole letter or anything. I'm just going to try to give you some of the high points and also address a couple of other things that have gotten said this evening so far. <coughs> And since we just sort of finished on parking, um, we'll, I'll, I'll start I'll deal with my parking comments. The parking study that was done um, was done in the winter time, which is not representative of the normal parking demand of Park Concord. But even so, it shows that the Stop Stowe Street lot was full on January 18th, 2018, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. And so neither the parking study or the town planner in her comments points out that the library is planning to increase its daytime attendance. It got alluded to a little bit. You were thinking more nighttime, but they're also really planning a lot more daytime activities mm -hmm. that could and special events that could accommodate up to 150 people in the new forum space. Stowe, the Stowe Street lot has only 41 unregulated spots, so no amount of scheduling co cooperation between the umbrella and the library is going to create enough space to handle this increased parking demand. So if you do endorse giving the library parking relief, just do so knowing that you're not giving relief to those of us in the surrounding neighborhoods who are already dealing with uh, commuter traffic, since there's only three hour parking on Little Street now, Academy Lane is parked up. Um, so just, I'm not saying don't give that relief, but just do so being fully aware that, that you're, we have an increased problem. This isn't going to, solve the problem. It's not the library's job to solve that problem, but it's going to be an increased problem and it will not be giving relief to the neighborhood. I have a lot of concerns and one of the reasons I think that Mr. Flint was struggling with um, trying to calculate what the square footage was is that, um, that nothing in the plans have really um, showed you just how much of the house is going to be demolished. And it's pretty close to, if not even more than, 50% of the house being taken down. And that may not trigger the demolition delay, but it's a substantial amount of demolition. And that's why there's quite a lot of massing to this project, because so much of the house is, 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 um, getting, is getting demolished. Um, and the new, pro this, all of this new structure is really obscuring the, the rear portion of the house that's left. Um, the town planner um, has suggested that uh, the library provides some additional information to you regarding sustainability. And um, I, we all recently received a flyer with our light bill talking about the benefits of geothermal. And the library really should be at the forefront of sustainability in this project. And I would really encourage them to take another look at how they are being sustainable here. All this demolishing is not a particularly sustainable thing when you know, there's existing structures that could get be used as well. I have a suggestion to make about the handicapped parking, and that's that you consider flipping the, the bump out drop off that's on the south side and put that on the north side and put the handicapped parking and the bump out on Sudbury Road. Main Street has a lot more traffic that comes down, and if you're a handicapped person and you've got to open your door out of the driver's side and get crutches out or get a walker out, 
um, you've got a lot of more traffic coming at you than you would on Sudbury Road in that little block of Sudbury Road, um, comparatively speaking. The, the library, I don't think, has really walked the walk that they're asking their mobility impaired people to, to undertake. Here you've got to come in here and then go around this ramp. And at the last page of my letter, there's a diagram of, in red showing what the library's plan is for a mobility impaired person. And then I'm offering my alternative plan in green, coming in from Sudbury Road and using the existing handicapped ramp. So you've already got less structure that you have to build because we're about an ADA compliant ramp. It would reduce the amount that a person has to walk from approximately 275 feet from approximately 250 feet to 175 feet, 30% reduction in how much a mobility impaired person would have to walk. So I think if you really want to try to make it easier for disabled people to access this library, far easier way would be to use your existing entrance. And that also solves some of the confusion that Mr. Johnson was referring to about how do you let people know really where they're supposed to come into this library. The, the principal entrance to the library really is on Sudbury Road, and this keeps that principal entrance there. Um, and I, I, I think there are just a lot of benefits to mobility impaired people, but I think there are also some potential design benefits in, in rethinking how you bring people in. It would let you then not necessarily have to have such a large ramp space in here. Uh, you could handle that with a platform lift. You could shrink the link uh, and, and shrink some of this massing. Um, not in my letter are some comments about the landscaping plan that they've submitted and discussed with you that still perpetuates an error that I pointed out in March to the HTC. And they're showing trees planted right where my fence is. And so you've got a slightly false impression of really what this is going to look like, and that's still not been um, corrected. Um, I think, Mr. Johnson, that you were correct from your chairman's breakfast and your sense that there is still some feedback to be incorporated from the HDC. I've made some extensive correspondence and presentations to the HDC that's up on the website, and I encourage you to look at that information as you go through your review process. I do not think that this is at a point where it will be rubber stamped, and I think it's a mischaracterization to give you that sense that everything is hunky-dory over on the HDC end. Um, they did not show the west facade to you because there's still quite a lot of jumble and the fenestration and the appearance of the west facade. There is, in my, in my presentation at the June meeting of the HGC, you will see the west facade and some proposals for how that could become more um, uh, historically appropriate. Um, I recently became a food service, certified food service manager, so I have just a brief comment about the coffee in the kitchen. We're talking about daily coffee. We're not talking about just special, special events food. And the BD Center tried daily coffee and abandoned it because staffing it and maintaining it to meet food service standards and whatnot became very difficult to keep the area clean. They ultimately abandoned it. So I really encourage the library to rethink this, partly because, as um, uh, Ms. Hughes was saying, there are so many different sink requirements and stuff once you start getting into all this. Um, that uh, it's it's really a can of worms that why not just BYO and that there are nine coffee places within five minutes walk um, where people can get coffee and bring in and just let people bring in plug in whatnot but don't get it out, get out of the coffee service business that's just from as a newly minted food service manager thank you very much for your time and for reading my letter and I appreciate it okay thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Paul, question on that? Uh, sure. I just want to make sure we get through. The yeah, I, I'm really intrigued by your point on the on the handicapped parking. Is there a specific reason why you want handicapped on on Main and the and the existing 15 minute drop off on Sudbury? If you consider no, it's something, something we would certainly look at. There are a number of functions that currently take place on the Sudbury Road full out. Mm -hmm. One of the most important activities is the book pickup. So books are transferred through the Minuteman mm -hmm. network between libraries and they're, they're brought right up into the office area at Sudbury Road entrance, placed on carts and sorted mm -hmm. every day. So it would be a little bit more challenging to do that from the other side. I also watch it as a real convenient spot for folks who are just going into the library to return books, 
or pick something up quickly, you're allowed to go and spend five minutes. There's also an after hours book drop. I pass by there multiple times every day and I frequently see people there early in the evening. Now maybe we could change some of those functions and look at it as an alternative, but um, there, there's a lot of benefit other than accessibility on the current subway road side, but it's something we'll consider. Yeah, I was thinking in particular, I think about when those vans come up and they have the ramp that comes out the side, there's a lot more bicycle traffic uh, on, on Main Street, I would think, than on Sudbury Road. And I know we've heard previously from cyclists who they were upset about when they the curbs were, were bumped out for, for, right. for yeah. crosswalks and people were hitting, hitting them on their bicycles. Mm -hmm. um, that um, it seems like that use, the handicapped use, would be more likely to be extending out into the bicycle corridor than it would be on Sudbury. Just, it's just a thought. I think it's a great point. Okay, uh, can I take another comment? Yes. Ed Nari, um, I live at 29 Academy Lane next to Sally, and also the house at 54 Sudbury Road directly opposite the rear elevation here. Okay. Um, and I am highly concerned about um, not only the uh, aesthetic in terms of the modern addition being placed in such a historic area. All the elevations are modern. I think you open the commentary by the modern entrance, um, and that's how it's perceived. Um, and frankly, if they put any more clapboard on it, it's going to look very similar to the museum addition. Having vertical posts, clapboard infill, it's it's basically vertical clapboard infill and, and plate glass at the entrance. I know that this is not the form for that necessarily, but it's highly concerning, highly disturbing to me personally that um, a significant modern addition is going to drop down to such a historic area. Um, on some more particular issues, um, I think the civil engineer or the architect might have mentioned that there's some lighting in the back and the rear. Um, it's been represented at the HEC that there is no lighting in the rear. I'd just like to get that clarified. Uh, no lighting outside lighting fixtures. Uh, I thought they were bollards, was what I heard. So, uh, sorry. So, um, go ahead and finish your concerns and then yeah. direct sure. it to the board, and the board will that's uh, fine. reply. Because it has been represented at the HDC is that there was no lighting pictures at the back side of the property, the rear of the property. Um, as far as the shades go, um, today um, I know both the Sally and, and Sandy and ourselves have expressed concerns for over a year now that there are two punched windows in the library that are that have had no blinds on them. I think one of them is in the stacks and one is a, adjacent to the stacks. And they they cause a fairly considerable amount of light pollution when it's dark out. Um, obviously the lighting in the library is more than your average at home, so it's a fair amount of home. And it's it, it it casts a fair amount of light pollution. Um, we've addressed or we've brought this up at the HDC, uh, particularly along the rear elevation. That is nothing but a modern uh, ele elevation with primarily glass. Dusk is later than sunset. So that's a concern right there that uh, whatever final rendition the addition takes, uh, I would think sunset would be the absolute latest those, those shades are going down. And certainly if it's 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a winter's day with snow on the ground, the light coming out of that with the requirements of lighting for a library, the entire side of that neighborhood is, will be greatly affected. Um, and to date, the library has been consistent, has been stubborn, and has not moved off that position whatsoever of a, of a glass wall abutting a backside neighborhood. So that, that is a concern uh, that we have. Um, and again, Sally's correct, the landscaping plans, both on her side and on the side that faces Sudbury Street, the, the trees are almost shown directly on the fence line, uh, some of the added trees, which just obviously can't happen. There's no one can use to in the library, they won't be added. Um, but it, the, the trunks can't go on the property. Um, and then just to ask the board a question, is the planning board 
the governing authority for the conditions that will be proposed in the public permit. By that I mean the, the shades and the timing of the shades, the upkeeping of landscaping, et cetera, et cetera. Does that come from the different boards as they review those conditions? And the conditions will come from a number of different permits along the way. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just to that last point, um, we make a recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals. We will recommend a number of conditions uh, that, uh, you know, there's all these other committees that we're, we're gathering all of these up as they come along. They will eventually be part of the special permit that would be granted by the ZBA. Thank you. Um, so uh, any other comments from the public? Okay, um, perhaps any responses from the applicant to the, any of the public if comments that you heard? I could respond to some of Ed's comments. Um, the, uh, Ed and Sally and Sandy have made comments about two existing windows on the second floor on the west side of the library that have been in place for 20 odd years or something in there. And in the evening from their properties, so even though it's quite a ways away, it does shine out. Those shades were installed today Mm -hmm. um, and this, I apologize it took so long to do that. The only problem is we wanted them to be on automatic timers um, so that it didn't become a person's responsibility to lower them each day. And the, the Wi-Fi isn't good enough in the library right now, so we're working to address that um, so that they're on automatic timers. But those, those were just completed. It also makes, I, I think, a good clarifying point between sunset and dusk and um, I'm not a technical expert on the definition, but it sounds like sunset is a more practical time that the automatic lights, the automatic shades would go down. They'll be on a light sensor outside that will trigger them, so they'll automatically change through the seasons of the year. Um, and we'll confirm that in the HTC submittal. The, li the library has agreed not to have nighttime programming in the children's garden. In the in the south side of the, of the property. Um, however, the building code requires lighting at the egress of all doors. It's a code requirement. These are night sky compliant lights that have been re reviewed. Um, so I, I, I may have misstated previously that there's no light, but the code does require lights at all egress, emergency egress doors. Um, um, it, it could be interpreted if you look at the landscaping plan, which, by the way, you have. You're looking at it right yeah. now. It may look as if the evergreen trees that are planted, that are have been added to the landscaping plan to offer a buffer for the adjacent neighbors. It may appear that they're on the lot line or planted on the fence, but that's a graphic representation. They're actually intended to be just inside of the fence so that they will um, provide evergreen. Ed has a really good example on the separation between his property and Sally and Sandy's property where many years ago they planted very small evergreens and those have grown up to be a, a wonderful buffer but they do need to be outside the fence. Some of those we're looking at are existing trees by the way, the white pines that, right are, that are right on the lot line, those exist today. Um, and lastly, we did actually change the landscaping plan adjacent to these two parcels. Some of you may be aware of the seed garden program, the seed library, mm -hmm. loving library, follow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. we previously had a seed garden to enhance that and support the seed uh, lending program, but we've removed that recently and um, to allow for more buffer planting between the properties, and we think that's an improvement. Thank you. Can I just ask, since you installed those shades today, are they the same type of shade as what you're proposing for the glass walls in terms of they block 93%? Or are they full they blackout? Yeah. yeah, they just don't go down automatically today until we get it uh, But that would be useful for the public if yeah. they wanted to understand the what the, the what these are going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. Although, I don't know if many people would be able to get in the right orientation <laughs> yes. relative to them um, without trespassing. Um, so, okay. Um, so then you guys will be coming back to us after you meet with the HDC, after we get the engineer's report. Um, 
I'm trying to think what else we're looking for, we're, we're needing. Those are the main two things. So, um, <coughs> they could bring the transportation consultant. Bring the transportation consultant to talk about what? Parking? Then ask. To, to talk about what aspect of the parking. Whether there's adequate parking. Um, is that not? I thought he was. They mentioned that he's on vacation. That's not why. That's why he's not here. No. Well, there was the landscape architect who was on vacation. Oh, my bad. Yeah. Sorry. The landscape architect's on vacation. Um, and I'm not sure. If we could. We could certainly reach out to Van Asten. No. Well, I want to correct that too, Matt. Sorry. They're mad. But so, sorry. But maybe it's not warranted. Well, it's just. I think the the main open issue for me uh, relative to the parking, my main still uh, remaining concern is just accommodation of additional staff, it, just in terms of providing the same sorts of um, parameters for relief as we have uh, used in this area in the past. Again, I don't know what options are available. People get creative. Uh, I'm just looking for some creativity there. That's what I'd like to see personally. Um, so, um, and then I think that um, Elizabeth had wondered whether we wanted to give some guidance in terms of what how we feel about this application now so that she could begin to provide uh, to draft a report so that we could uh, come to a decision next time so any feedback on the application as you see it now that we've gotten the full view of it um, well I, I certainly I'd want to see the final feedback from the HTC before making a recommendation. Yeah. But I, I don't think there's a lot of large issues here in the report. I mean, I, I mentioned before, I'd want to see the condition being a bike rack. I, I would be curious on exploring the idea of, of changing the handicap with the 15 minute drop off. Um, I yeah, I think a, that sounds really if, interesting too. I don't know if that's, um, I, it's not a condition of, I, I, per se. I, I think that's that's what would be in the final plan or not. Um, I don't know. Maybe you can provide some input on that. So I think the only input may be, um, you know, the town does have a disabilities commission um, you know, to get you know their input mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. that. Um, I I do agree with. Um, your comment about um, you know, it's not just handicap, but also you know, your comment about bicycling. Um, well, it's just whether breaking there's up more, Main Street whether more. there's more bicycling on Main area. Street yeah. or you know Sudbury Road, I think I think both equally you know are you know, heavily biked, mm -hmm. but uh, the, you know there is definitely you know, more traffic on Main Street than there there is on Sudbury Road. Well, um, in fact, it can be backed up there. Well, the for, the other, you know, the other um, existing physical constraint on Main Street, you know, there, you know, there's parking on both sides of the street. So visually for a driver, it feels much narrower yeah. and not having room to, you know, to, yeah. to move over or, or I'm going to say drift to the center. Um, on Sudbury Road, there is no parking on the opposite side of the street, so it does provide a little bit better sense of mobility. Um, so I think you know, the, I don't know the timing. You know, if the applicant can get input from the Disabilities Commission, um, but I can at least reach out to the Public Works Director, and um, you know, get a little bit more feedback. But I think, uh, I, I think not only just the handicap accessibility side of things but i do think your comment regarding you know just bicycling and mm -hmm. volume wise that yeah. having it on the other side is something to think about yeah i'll, I'll just offer a response also thank you elizabeth i actually have a meeting i've met with jean goldsbury a number of times and i have a meeting set up with her next week to review this issue and i'll seek her advice okay it may be a little tricky it's a really interesting concept, so I appreciate Sally raising it. 
the pros and cons as I, I flow through it. And I think we need to work through that process. It'll be a little tricky for us right now because we've submitted this design to the HTC. Mm -hmm. However, I think their purview stops at the edge of the street. I may be mistaken about that in a public way. Um, so it may be, we wouldn't change anything on library property if we swapped the handicap to the other right. side. But I think it deserves a thorough vetting of the pros and cons, so we'll commit to doing that okay. and figure out how to, na to navigate this middle process. Yep. And then otherwise for me, it seems like, you know, in, in the actual site plan review portion of the memo, I think there's a number of small issues that we're waiting for information to come back to. And my view on the parking is, um, I mean, I'm inclined to not have a concern with it, but in, you know, in the larger, I, I'm, I'm, we've got Nero, Emerson, and, and this that are coming online within 18 months of each other, roughly. Right. Right. And so we had parking studies done that we looked at very closely um, with Emerson, with Nero. The, there's been some foundational changes in this area. Um, right. I, I was actually going to ask, does anybody recall that when Nero opened, when was that? Is that a year ago? A year ago. So this was done, and your parking was done in spring, in January and March. Yeah. Me. So the yeah. only the only thing I can add, you know, on the on the parking side of it, um, is that um, there are spaces behind Emerson Umbrella when the parking study um, was done that were not available. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, you know, the town is going to um, reconstruct the stove parking lot and we'll be adding additional spaces. I can't remember off the top of my head how many that is. I want to say there's 41 now. I think it's going to like 60. Mm. I think they're adding, you know, like 20 additional spaces um, to the lot yep. as well. Okay. So those are two factors that, you know, that come into play. Yeah, I'm, I guess I would be in favor of, of recommending approval on the, on the request for relief on parking. Um, I'm, I'm just more waving the flag that this, I think it's gonna get tighter in the future. Well, yeah, well, and, and then I think also we just need to have consistent standards. That That's my mm -hmm. <laughs> my concern. I mean, we're this is not gonna be the last relief for parking application we're gonna get, um, I suspect, in this area. So uh, I think this is something that the, you know, as each of these applications comes forward, you know, the board started in 2016 with these criteria, uh, criteria um, and they're helping. You have, you, have a, you have a meeting coming up with the Board of Appeals to talk about potential zoning bylaw amendments, yeah. and this is one of them. Um, but you know, right now, under the zoning bylaw, um, I, I think the criteria you've established since 2016 have definitely gone, you know, a long way to to providing that consistency? Well, yeah, but I'm just saying in this case, uh, you know, the part that seems missing to me is just the provisions for additional staff. That that just seems to be the one part. And, and that's why I keep harping on that. But, uh, you know, when I look at our criteria, how we're dealing with stuff, that's, that's a gap. Um, okay, so I think that's where we stand right now. I don't. I don't know. That, I mean, I think you've gotten all the feedback, right? So we're we're going to be looking at the construction sequencing plan coming in. Is the well, engineering no, department response? So the construction response. sequencing plan. That's a condition of approval. Right. Um, that's not something that would be done now and presented okay. to the board. Because it's been presented to us before. The, the you know the umbrella presented theirs, and the Concord Academy presented theirs to us. Both of them. Um. I mean, not, you know, not in, not in any detail because that's, that's where we learned about the temporary parking lot, how they were accommodating all of the construction staff. Well, I mean, because this is a sensitive area for during construction. So for for Concord Academy, they had to they had to provide you that um, it wasn't their construction sequencing plan. That's um, much more detailed and different. They had to show you the temporary parking lot because they actually needed a permit for that. Um, they also had to show you that because they um, were utilizing the existing tennis courts for um, trailers that had to be permitted. So it was a little different. The construction sequencing plan um, will not be done until the actual contractor is on board 
the site supervisor is there, they go through, they have their, their sequencing of when um, materials get delivered, uh, when certain things get set up, when certain things get established. But then the umbrella also told us about how they were going to reconfigure their parking and, uh, and um, placement of trailers and so forth during the construction period. And I mean, we haven't gotten any kind of information like that here. So that's, I, I don't know, we're not getting as much information, I would just say, versus these other adjacent projects. If it's not the construction sequencing plan, it's some information about how the, you know, the neighborhood is gonna get impacted during the construction process and what accommodations are gonna be made to prevent further negative impacts, that's all. Um, I mean, do you do you have such a, a, a scheme? I mean, where are you in conceptualizing how you will do that? Well, uh, we have preliminary concepts on that. Okay. And we'll see if we can develop them to give you a better understanding. Okay, and yeah, maybe I'm asking for the wrong thing as far as the construction sequencing plan, but some information about how yeah. sure. during the construction process you're going to mitigate impacts. That's, that's what I was looking at. Okay, um, so I think those are the things that. You, you've heard now. Um, we're okay. Um, so then I'll continue this uh, until our next meeting, which is first week of August, I believe it is, August, August 6th. 6th. Um, so we'll we'll um, continue at that what time. What would you like me to do, if anything? Uh, I mean, it seemed like there is enough balls in the air that w we can't really write anything up quite yet. I mean, what do you think? Um, it's your direction. I mean, I. Um, it just seemed like there, there were still quite a few things. Uh, again, I don't know what's going to happen at the HDC, yeah. but yeah, um, when are you going in front of the ZBA, or do you know? August eighth. Real soon well, now. Well, when when they will open the public hearing. Okay. Yeah, you're not going to make a decision on the first night, so I think we're okay if we if we do our decision, you know, our recommendation next time based upon additional information, and then we do our approval at the, the next meeting, right? Because that's how we'd have to do it. You'd have to write it up, yeah. Is that, I don't think that's gonna get in your way. You'll, you'll have our, our verbal recommendation going into the ZBA. Thank you. Um, I think we have a fairly succinct list, and the deliverables are pretty straightforward. So okay. We'll get those back to you as soon as possible. And, yeah. And ideally, if those need your approval, then it will be an approvable project. Yeah. Okay. I, that's what I feel. Yeah. No, it's not like that. There's uh, things just wide open. It's it's really more nailing down some details. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Okay, then I think we're done with that agenda item and we'll move on to the rest of the business. If uh, you're going to leave at this point, please move all the way outside the building if you're gonna have conversations because we may not close that door and it does get confusing. Okay, all right. Um, Thank you. Why don't we do a couple of quickies here of uh, the minutes? How about that? Um, uh, minutes. Yeah. So I have to say, I, I went through the July 9th meeting minutes and I did pick up one thing that I wanted to be added and I've already- June 25th? Please. Okay, sure. <laughs> June 25th minutes, any, any comments from anybody? Um, be easy then. Um, no comments. 
Okay, so then I will entertain a motion. I make a motion. Well, okay, we'll do these separately. Make a motion that we approve the minutes of June 25th, 2019 as drafted. All, uh, any second? Second. All in favor? Okay. And then uh, July 9th minutes. Uh, so what I found on uh, page three of that was under the planning board goals. You, you may recall, um, Elizabeth had mentioned that we got the grant for the transit-oriented development uh, at the Throw Depot. And as a consequence, we added that as a high priority goal to the list. So I thought that was worth mentioning in our minutes. So I suggested adding that as a second sentence there. Okay. Everything else I thought was just fine. Thank you, motion that we approve the minutes as uh, amended upon with Matt's recommendation for Second. July 9th, 2019. Second. All in favor? Okay. We have taken care of minutes. Okay. Um, so, back to our housing initiatives. We continue to march forward. Um, before, can I just? Yeah. I, I just want to um, congratulate and commend the planning board for getting the grant at Throw Depot. It's a big deal and it's exciting. Yeah, it is. It's exciting. And it means it's yet another thing piled on That's our right. plate. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it, it creates a, a real balance of all the things that yeah. we're working on. So, um, so um, a couple of different things for, and I guess we should again, as we did last time, start with old business and then work towards new business. So the old business was kind of homework on the village PRD concept and the sheet that, uh, that one sheet that was distributed, it was not just redistributed tonight. So um, if the dog ate your homework, uh, can, we can bring it up online. Um, but yeah, as you may recall, we got partway through this discussion. We, we especially spent a lot of time with Alan on the uh, different kinds of, um, you know, patterns of development that could preserve some open space but yet allow more density, uh, though they were also architecturally quite distinct from what we have had historically in Concord. And then we talked about different ways to reduce the impact of the neighborhood by perhaps adjusting setbacks based upon the height of the building. Um, but uh, then we didn't get a chance to get into all these other pieces. So, um, you know, for example, bonus density. Um, so we are in the past provided bonus density for, um, you know, providing affordable units or, uh, you know, for conservation. So we could provide bonus density based upon, a, for example, a better energy rating index, right? So stretch code today says this, the energy rating index is 55. We could say, hey, if you want to go to 40 or something like this, that you get another unit or something, another 10% or, you know, and I don't know what the formula would be, but, you know, because it would need to be something that would be economically favorable, but um, that's a question. Is that how we want to incent this? Uh, because I have a feeling the only way we can do this is through incentives. We can't do it through requirements. Right. I mean, we get back to conflicting with the building code, right? You don't want to uh, create a condition of construction that's more that, that conflicts with building code. That was what at least I've heard. Another thing is, you know, do we change the terms for uh, affordable uh, bonus and then also do we have a higher maximum density than we have had, right? Currently, we only have, um, you know, eight an acre in residence C with all density bonuses applied maximum, right? Um, you could go up to 12 an acre. That's where you get to like more like a smart growth type of level with if you have a two and three family units. Um, 
Am I the only one that can't read that? That's better. Thanks. Okay. There we go. That looks good. Yeah, I can read that even without my glasses. Um, so, any comments on bonus density as a concept, as an incentive? There, if you saw the history, there's been definite changes in how that formula has been applied and kind of some cautionary tales as far as like you can make things too draconian and then no one builds anything. Um, so with <clears throat> the increasing the density, you're keeping the requirement for open space the same. Like they're not the fifty percent. Yeah. Well, so that's another cool question, you know, is that if for the village PRDs, is that necessary um, or desirable? And again, Alan was trying to show, well, if you build up, you could potentially still keep mm -hmm. the space, right? Um, versus out. So. Yeah. So, so I, I'm in favor of the bonus density. So I. I I was struck by reading through some of this that oh, yeah. this was in response to Concord Green. Right. And a lot of Garden what we're apartments. talking about is kind of moving in that direction. Like no garages, parking barns, stacked housing that's clustered together. These are all things that we're you know, tentatively proposing and it's just interesting to me that this was put in place to sort of stop that from continuing to happen. Right. Especially this, you know, discussion about, well, you know, keeping open space, do we need to keep that? Like, it begs the question, <laughs> are we going against why this was put in place in the I first keep place? Open space. Yeah. Right, well, so I think that one of the concerns with this was that there wasn't as much of an open space provision prior to this. Right. So um, I do think it's ironic that uh, Concord Green is actually quite a popular uh, development at this point. It's kind of hit a, a kind of a renaissance, uh, if you will. Um, and so uh, there are aspects of it that are actually desirable. And then there are others, I think, that, you, that this is a good example of why you would want to make some changes. And so, yeah, trying to protect open space and yet allowing a pattern of development that is more dense and where you know people create a sense of community because of that density that they're kind of they bump into each other all the time um is not necessarily a bad thing i'm not opposed to it yeah. it's just yeah it's just interesting it was, it was well in 40 funny. something years <laughs> yeah, has gone by was, you know so changed. people's yeah, uh, yeah priorities have changed yes um i think at the time too that like garden apartments were you know they were just exploding all over America so I, I think that pe there was a sense of like that it was a threat um, so um, here's a question uh, what was in the space does anybody know of Concord Green prior to Concord Green I don't does think there was know? a lot I don't think there was much there <laughs> this but. was 1979 before uh, yeah, before that so like that mid or early mid 70s yeah that'd be interesting we can go back and look at the maps i, I was curious what happened there because i know that, like there were some other developments was, was like eight. in uh lexington <laughs> yeah why don't you know uh like in lexington that somewhat similar developments but they have formerly been like small um, par three golf courses how many prds are there? In How many PRDs are there in Concord? Oh, I don't know off the top of my head. A couple head. dozen. Yeah, yeah well, that brings me to the other thing. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you for putting together those maps. Maybe we can look at, yeah, look at those. So yeah. Oh. When did you send those out? Oh. Yeah, I didn't see the final. I saw the draft. The maps. Maps. The three maps you got? I saw the draft first three maps. Were those, let's see. When did you send those out, Elizabeth? And not that I am. Maybe I didn't Friday. look at the. Friday. Because we had had a discussion by email 
where you know the parcels had been identified yeah, by size and you had said you were going to relook. Oh, okay, I didn't. Okay, I didn't look um, at the. So, how about how about 1970? <laughs> um, oh, that's cool. Oh, so it's just like a farm. I I I don't know what's whatever that is. And some stuff lined up outside. Looks like a farm. Yeah. What is that? What does that say? P. Pond. 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 U. C. Four C. I don't. I don't know what it was. But oh well, they put in ponds, right? They. Yeah. Those are man-made ponds that they created. Yeah. So there was definitely. This was a stream. Or a drain. It could have been a drainage, a drainage <laughs> ditch to a pond, to a drainage ditch, yeah. to the wetland over here, and then these were it superimposed the buildings that went over it. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Cool. I think they still have the same stuff in right at two seventy seven Baker Ave. There. What's that? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. building right on the tracks. Right. <laughs> it's always got boats and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I think you're right. I know I'm those maps. Yeah, so we were looking for those maps. Is that what we're? Yeah. Did you say? Yeah. yeah I, I, would, I would love some help interpreting those. Um, okay. Can we start with Bus Concord? Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, so these are the walking distance maps? Yeah. But there was. Um, there was but one there was the other. Uh, I think it's the parcel size. size, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yep. So. So the yellow is the outline of the residency zone district. Mm -hmm. um, any property that is um, has hash marks is town owned, whether mm -hmm. that's municipal, open space, recreation, conservation, doesn't matter. It's just it's held by the town in some manner. Yep. So you know, right out playground. This is um, natural resources. This is the school, this is natural resources, um, and then the color coding says, you know, you know what the square footage is. Right, so anything that's green or above could be a PRD in theory. I mean, that maybe not in practice based upon some other criteria, but... Well, so, like, this is the church. That'll, yeah. that'll never happen. So, right. I mean, there's, there's definitely some, you know, some in here. Yeah, these over here, you know, there's, you know, the wetland extends, you know, you know up further than where the edge of the property is. Um, but others, these over here. Right. Mm. I think this so, is, I think. What's with that yellow one? Yeah, that shouldn't that also uh, be marked? This one? Yeah, that's got to be at least 30,000 square feet. That's my, that's where I live. That's Riverwalk. Oh, okay, so that already is, it's already <laughs> a PRD. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are quite a few parcels, actually. Well, well I don't know, you've got... Not okay. really. This is all floodplain, this one right here. Oh. This is the acid Oh, yeah, that's no way that could be developed. Plan, yeah. that's, right. that's all floodplain. The big one that's in the middle. Has a this, one, this one right here? There's yes. a proposal for that one, right? Yes, on that one, definitely. Um, this that's one you're one already, already looking at. The, yeah. um, this is Wedgwood Common over here. That's right. Fine. But um, which could be redeveloped someday, potentially. And... I guess so. Uh, um, that this one right that's here. That's apartments. Um, well, I also there's one over a little bit further. Um, right here, the Rapoli land. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be another one, but that's not within walking distance to the train station. Um, okay, so there really so isn't much. Yeah, I would say so there's one. Really. <laughs> Oh, sorry, which one? Well, this one right here. Yeah. Oh. And that one's already in some form of process. Is that what no? Oh, okay. it's still on Langport. Okay. Um. And then those right on Route Two. That that doesn't. 
make any. This one, I, 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 this is, I think this is state owned. This little okay. purple one down here. Um, that's the church. Um, this is a small one. Well, is that the one that possible. they're going to do the two family with the Habitat for Humanity? That's down here. Oh, okay, that right there next to it. Okay. Huh. Um, All right, so we're saying one. Uh, this one, I'm not, I'm not sure about this one. Um, I know who that is. And, and that's wetlands. It's primarily wetlands. Yeah. It's my next one. Wetlands and blueberry bushes. Wetlands I've been to the house. To yeah, blueberry. Bits. <laughs> there. Yeah. So th this is the parcel that you had lit up there. Mm -hmm. This yeah. one, and it's essentially wetland from here to here. This one, there's another one that's lit up that there's currently a proposal under. It's under agreement. Right. And, and then the and one, one right against, against the river, right. Which one against? Oh, that's Westville. Sorry, Westville. Yeah, yeah. sorry, it's developed. There's, um, I'm just not finding. FEMA flood. Uh, I mean, I guess you could look at. Floodplain Conservancy. Wetlands Conservancy District. Floodplain Conservancy District. It yeah. goes all the way up to here. Yeah. So, I mean, whether there's some potential up in this area. Also, if they combined yeah, with these two lots. These yeah. Under contract yeah. Even though okay. the vast majority of it is. So, well, uh, which one that was? It's this, this, and this. Oh, okay, okay. So, whether these could be combined to do something. That's this one right here. Yeah. Okay. So that's what's happening over here, or will be happening over here. Right. Okay, so talking about potentially three PRD areas. And a fourth under one the over existing, here. Under the existing <coughs> threshold for what? Right, the 40,000 okay. threshold. But the other one outside of that is outside of the half mile mm -hmm. radius. So it wouldn't be a village period. Right. Well, right. in fact, even if you were going to do literally half mile versus residency, I suspect that even Riverwalk uh, is right at the limit. It, it, oh. well, right. Three right quarters of a mile. Oh, there it is. Mile. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the Riverwalk 2 would be beyond the three quarter. Yeah. Was this exercise primarily to think about whether we're going to change the threshold level on PRDs yes. for the size? Or well, are we, the, are we the, looking the at range, just more generally to think like, there, what are these sites like in, in terms of all the other... So uh, there were two objectives here. Okay. Yeah, one was whether to do the threshold size minimum PRD. And I think that, well, this is, we've only looked at West Concord, but, um, you know, it seems like it's a pretty good threshold of standards as it stands. The second is that what is the limit of of uh, the half mile right. versus three quarter mile. And what would, you know, do we set one of those two as an overlay or do we instead just go with residence C? Okay, thanks. Well, uh, also just more broadly, is it worth doing all of this if it's going to result in affecting one? one. Well, potential? that's where the combination <laughs> of the two comes in, exactly. And so, all right, Can so we, should we okay. look at the others? I think the one, I think it's the depot that had the most. Okay. The depot had the most? I mean, well, okay. Okay. Center. I don't know. Wow, look at all those back on the back yeah. side of Pilgrim. But, and that's resident C, huh? Yes, but I will. But those have I'll all been the, recently right. built out as oh, big yeah. houses. Um, and uh, but I'll do yeah, the flood I'll, I'll do the yes. I'll okay. Do the okay. Exercise. Yeah. Like, no, but also it's seen those significant. Places. They have been just built out. Yeah. They've all been built out. They're not. They're not going to swap that to a PRD anytime in the next 
20 years. True. So yeah. over almost over half yeah. of those lots are in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll toggle back and forth. Oh. Yeah. So that's these. Okay. So those are no go. Uh, the ones I would note would to like even even this that one is massively yeah flooded. Yep. And then this one is already developed I don't as know. an apartment complex. Correct. I don't know how it was yeah. developed. But that could be redeveloped. That it it, it is actually kind of. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. huh. I don't know how it would be redeveloped denser than this because <laughs> I, I I can't remember how many units are in each of these. I know they're not single family dwellings. Definitely so. not. I want to say there might be like four units. In there each are probably four plexes. Yeah. 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 Well, each one has at least four parking spaces in front of it. So. Okay. Can you toggle back to the other map? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thanks. <clears throat> So it's the armory so, at the corner over it. So I'm a little confused. The stuff that's that's like this area, is this just not residency? Correct. Right. So this is It's well, all Crosby, along Marvin, Sudbury Road. It's in the historic district for Harborville. Beyond there. On the other side. So this is all the thorough depot zone district is in here? Mm -hmm. Right. And then it goes to residence B out there. Or is it even residence A? I think it's residence B. So this is Thoreau Depot. This is residence B. Yeah. So in this, so here we're talking about. So there's significant amount of residence B that's within a half mile of, and even three, you know, half and three quarters of a mile. This this area back in there. Again, I doubt that you know Sudbury Road itself is much of a target for PRD development. But then there's this street. What's it called back there? This one down here. No, I was thinking, isn't there something back? No, I guess there's farmland there. Yeah, okay, there's nothing else back there. The Wheeler land. Yeah, but that's under conservation, right? Correct. Yeah. So can we, looking at this map, is there anything that's a reasonable candidate for? for? I don't know what this one is. Those are uh, apartments. These are already. That's the uh, That's yeah. Right. Those are the throw court apartments. Oh, it's on this side. My mother-in-law lives there. Now on the other side. On this side. Yeah, you know, you, there's there's Starbucks, and then there's you turn, you go past, oh, and there's there the little yeah. sign that says, you know, don't turn in our driveway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the orange next? What's uh, one nineteen one twenty one? Uh, on Sudbury Road. The orange one adjacent one? to the red? Yeah. That's this one right here. I think that's just a house. Yeah. That's it? Yeah. Uh, well, but it's a two family. Uh, I think. Mm, okay. Maybe it's red. But, and it's in the historic district. Okay. Um, there are lots of constraints in this. It's just lots. And that, that's why I was saying, you know, if we go out. To the, it doesn't, mile, to the mile marker. Well, it I doesn't mean, it, open up that much more, but at least it Well, I think I, my attitude is starting to change on this, where I'm feeling like that while we've spent a lot of attention on recent PRDs that would, you know, be in this district, they may be the last couple mm. that ever could be. Mm. Yeah. And so are we spending a lot of time developing a bylaw for something that can't get built? I mean, because there aren't any parcels left. Well, you could have one here. 
that house mm -hmm. <sighs> that would be it, it would that be Wait, is that the, the demolition the delay bylaw would be invoked in a millisecond <laughs> yes, right sir. so it's a demolition delay bylaw yeah i know but it's also a historic district. Yeah. The HDC would have to approve anything that would happen there, right? To, to correct. So like the house, the house, the the house structure. may not be demolished. Right. But, uh, it doesn't mean that they can't build something else. Back in there. In this it's incredible property. 1.5 yeah. plus it, acre wow. property wow. in the middle of town. We gotta do something with that property. Um, People would go. <laughs> well, yeah, Crazy. but it's, uh, property <laughs> rights are strong, you know. Um, so, well, that's a very interesting one. Um, but to to write a bylaw. To write a bylaw. Yeah. For one yeah, property that thing. has. Well, I think that's called something else. But um, so. <laughs> and it would still have to come through here anyway. Well, I mean, what so. do we have to do this now? I mean, can you go through these properties and tell us what's developable under the current threshold? It, no. I, I don't have enough time in the day to do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, Fair enough. But no, because there's just there's so many. Yeah. I don't I don't you know is, are we talking about there are one story two story yeah um, three stories that no, go well, thirty five feet I don't no 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 I'm just talking no no sorry I'm just talking about which lots are potentially would come before us as PRDs oh is but that that's. Oh. That's so so far we, within the areas we've that's what been this at, is we've, giving we've, us we found two I know but it's yeah just, oh, one's like, it's in the land court and one is. Yeah. Within the half mile restriction, I think we can safely say 100% not worth doing. Well, let's let's just keep going. We haven't done Concord Center yet. <laughs> There's one more map. But wait, wait, I know. Wait, 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 hold it out. Sorry, hold it. What, what about the other ones? This one is. That's a house on so What about those green ones that were on Walden? So that you're only talking that's, you know, 36. It's below the threshold. So. The blues are below the only, current threshold. Yeah, so this is only, you know, this is like 3,600 square feet. Yeah, I haven't seen any reason to want to reduce the threshold yet. What's the green up on Walden? Those are those big long, that big long parcel that's next to the, um, that, cons the like, that conservation little area on the corner. Oh, that's not the only one. Next to Hayward Meadow. Yeah. Someone doesn't want to render. Oh, that's the walking map. Is it the. There, you go. there we go. Is it the judgment of. Elizabeth, the, the folks on the planning board, that PRDs are a really useful tool in meeting the objectives of both increasing diversity and affordability while uh, maintaining the sustainability goals. Like when you th when when you think about the other PRDs that have been developed, where did they increase diversity and affordability in the way that we now want to see it the, done? Well, the track the record has been very mixed, and that's why. I mean, there have been benefits, but there have also been challenges, mm -hmm. and I think that that's why we've been wanting to take another look at it. Okay. And I think that we we split it into these two areas of interest. One is in town ones because we weren't seeing stuff that was creating a walkable type of standard of development right that was one thing that we were wanting to do we say hey if you're in town let's get an in-town lifestyle around this stuff and then outside we were saying well we would like to see more sensitive preservation of open space you know because again the the town's goals out there are to in, you know to improve the visual consistency of the open space and natural resources. And so that's why this natural resource protection zoning uh, is, a, is an idea. So yeah, PRDs I think have helped versus a, a subdivision. Let's just take Comerford Road as an example. The, you know, a subdivision plan out there would have just mowed down a lot of beautiful, um, 
what's now conservation land. And so instead we've got, you know, a, a condo complex that's up in one corner in trails and woods, nice woods. So um, I think that there were a lot of comments on the design of the condo complex, but meanwhile, there was open space mm -hmm. conservation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's why we're not tossing out the PRD bylaw altogether, but we're trying to improve it. And one of the first steps was to say, well, okay, if we're gonna improve it, are we gonna create a special village PRD for in town? And here's the third of three maps to try to decide whether that makes sense. <laughs> So far, we, we would be doing it for two properties. So, well, what so, the, what's so here, I though? Can tell you, um, this is the church. Okay, so that that's not going to be a PRD. Um, I can well, tell you. Well, churches become other things. I mean, and now I think that church is doing very well, but nonetheless, some churches surprisingly stop becoming churches and they get converted to residential. Um, um. All right, so I, 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 I can tell you nothing along here. Yeah. This is all floodplain for the Mill Brook. Okay. Um, How about that Bedford Court at the. Uh, this one? Yeah. Um, Looks landlocked. It is landlocked. So I don't think there's. What is it? The potential for that. So. There is a house there. There's a house. Yep. So it's this parcel uh, right here. It's up on the hill. I think it's up on the hill. How do they get there? They um, likely have some type of driveway easement. Yeah, I think driveway off of Lexington Road. Huh. So they have a driveway easement okay. that comes off. Um, so this would not be possible for a PRD right um, it would not it wouldn't it doesn't have frontage the requirement you have to have frontage on an existing um, roadway so that does not have frontage okay it, unless they bought it combined out. a lot yeah, yeah. Um, so once again you're in a very significant historic like district. the American Mile. So I don't think you'd be <laughs> buying and demolishing any of these homes uh, as might well. Might be difficult. Might be controversial. Okay. Linking arms. <laughs> well, you could do it off Bedford Court, though, couldn't you, or no? And then the, well, that looks more problematic coming off of Bedford Court. Okay. Yeah. It, it, I mean, oh, you mean they could buy? They could buy that lot. Um, yeah. Okay. I, but still, those no, are all I, hypotheticals. Yeah. Uh, no, I can tell you that um, I even yeah, Bedford Court is it's twenty feet wide street. I think. I don't think the. I think. I think the right of way might be. What's adjacent to that? Is that Partridge? What, um, this is Partridge Lane up here. This. This thing. one up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's Residence B. That's not even Residence C. So, um, yeah, I, I think the existing pavement is like. 14 feet wide. <laughs> All right. And so what others are there out there? Anything else? And uh, this is the church parking lot. Yeah. Okay. And Bow Street. What is... Okay. And then, oh, Kai's Road. That Okay. I know those properties. Okay. Doesn't look like we have, there's not enough there. Not really. Okay, so well, that's helpful. I think that's very helpful. Okay, well then, I mean, there's still the question of the town-wide PRD mm -hmm. and whether we want to tweak the town-wide PRD at all. And that's where, again, I was looking at the open space design or natural resource protection zoning, those readings that were distributed today. Again, I don't know if anybody at any time, I mean, imagine these things arrive and you're at work and you're like, things, yeah. um, but just let me talk about uh, a few of the concepts here. Um, so one is that uh, a lot of these 
what they do is um, they work with a conservation like trust or something to identify the conservation uh, values of the site. So is there a brook? Is there a, a hill? You know, things like this that um, should be preserved. Okay, and then you identify the developable areas of the site versus those that should be maintained in their natural state as a, as a site inventory. And then what sometimes happens, and this was the article that I read uh, that, um, that Elizabeth distributed today, was that the town can actually buy the site and then resell uh, just the developable part to a developer and then maintain the rest as conservation. And it's actually very important that there be a kind of a bright line between the permitting group, which would be us, and the people that buy the site, which would probably be the select board. So, you know, cause you don't want a conflict of interest. Um, and apparently Northampton has done this like multiple times. And as a result has been able to create a lot of affordable housing um, and preserve a lot of land. And so uh, they, you know, of course the person who wrote the article was the Northampton person running the program. So they were very gung-ho about it, but it sounded fantastic um, on its face as just what they've been able to do. So when they, so the town buys it and then they buy, the town sells it to a developer. Uh, some portion of it yeah and when so have they did they develop a program where they said we want this kind of housing or did they just sell it to I mean, well, were they able to um maintain that much control over it um they i don't remember that but they were able to get external funding for in some cases and the other amazing thing is they have first right of refusal options to buy like a hundred properties in North Northampton oh, wow. that they've acquired for no dollars. Oh, that's so that basically over the years, this, this process has become so trusted that they actually have it set up for a lot of property in town. It just, so, I, I, I think this, this concept requires um, far more education. Yeah and, and um, a much broader discussion. Well, um, and this yeah. is the most extreme example I've yeah. heard. I mean, there are lots of other towns that have done various things, including transfer development rights from other sites, uh, lots of things, but this one was the most radical I've, I've heard. Of course, Northampton, they're, they're known for that kind of thing, but. Does the town have the capacity through the housing authority or to actually develop housing and then sell it to a private developer? Well, and by the way, the article also discusses that in some I'm communities sorry, that would be considered to be, you know, problematic. Uh, that, you know, well, a public entity, you know, first of all, they're getting in the middle of the property market. So they're in some sense manipulating property values, you might say. Some developers would cry foul about like, hey, the town's in here competing with me and, you know, I'm trying to develop a property and the town's going to buy it out from under me and then well, they're going to dictate the terms in which I can. No. But so so the, I, to answer your question, the town does not have the capacity to purchase property and develop housing. Not um, directly. Not directly. And I'll give you one. Um, there's lots of reasons, but the primary reason is that um, it, it's not physically possible. The town is required um, to pay um, prevailing wage for any any construction project that the town does um, and to pay prevailing wage to develop a housing project of any magnitude would um, would not make it financially I'm sorry. feasible. Yeah, we, I can, we can talk about it. Is, it. is the housing authority part of, the, is it a separate court, like entity than the town? They could build like affordable housing at different standards than... Um, no, the, um, the, but the Concord Housing Authority um, is also has different statutes under um, federal laws as far as um, HUD and um, the federal funds that they also get for being a housing authority. Um, when, when they do construct projects, mm -hmm. they are constructing them at prevailing wage. I mean, they're, um, it's, it's more costly for a public entity to, to construct anything than it is a private entity. Okay. Um, but 
but you know the housing authority i don't they haven't built any new housing i mean they renovated peter bulkley um everett gardens but they I mean they haven't right it's the chdc that's really taken yeah. on the building the new the concrete housing, housing, housing development corporation, development corporation. Okay. Um, which would likely be the entity that would be you know involved in something like this too we, we i'm missing the planning board the planning board role we'd be issuing special permits right here so there that's the other dimension to this is you know you can create this uh open space design zoning such that it's by right so that it would never even come in front of us somebody would just do it uh, but most of the time around here there'd be a special permit process and i think in concord we'd have a special permit process so we would be granting you know we'd be doing a site plan review and granting a special permit is what we'd be doing so um and one of the other interesting things that just to round out the discussion on this article was that um to sweeten the deal uh what northampton does is they uh waive some of the requirements for a subdivision if you do the things they want you to do so for example you could put a dead end street in a subdivision as long as it dead ends onto a conservation land mm. and so I, I don't know what our public safety people would say about that, but, you know, it's, it's just um, and then they were saying that as a consequence, virtually any new development that requires the building of a road is following this open space design concept, or I think what they were calling was li land, limited land, development. Is it land conservation? Land conservation development or something. Land. Anyway, there are like six different names for these things, but they're all basically the same type of concept. Um, so what I think the, the point of this discussion is getting a little late. I, I won't, don't want to run us too late, but we, you know, we're going to meet with the select board next Monday. So I think that the majority, so the majority of our discussion should be around the accessory dwelling unit and the two family concept. But I think that we do need to at least raise the issue where well, I think we now come to another conclusion, which is, hey, we thought about doing an in-town PRD. We've decided there aren't enough sites to make that worthy. Um, but then, and looking at the PRD, are there ways we can improve it by looking at open space design? And then, you know, note some of these concepts. Yeah, um, on that, that last piece, I would note some of the comments that stuck out in my mind from the 1889 or whatever, whatever 14, the 1440, 1440, yeah. uh, Maine were, cons were concerns about that the, the open space that was being preserved was, is wetland hard on the railroads track mm -hmm. that's cut up. Well, there's potentially a trail, trail access, but, but that it's, it's land that um, it's what's left over. It's, it's what's yeah. left over and is otherwise unbuildable. Mm -hmm. And see, that's what's really attractive about this open space design approach. Well, but you can, you you can change the current PRD exactly. um, regarding the open space that it, you know, um, that 75% of it needs to be upland. Um, none of, none, you know, um, it has to be, you know, all contiguous so it can't be right. here's a little chunk you know here's right. a little chunk here's a little chunk um so i mean there's different ways you can't wrap around the outside yeah, of the perimeter yeah, of a mean, lot it, there's different ways to strengthen you know the the language but what you also have to understand is that you know the prd it's a special permit and it's discretionary mm -hmm. we can and say no but the if board we do can say that well, you know, the the bylaw specifically says that the open space has to be of a size, shape, and of you know an area that you know provides an open space benefit to at least the residents of the PRD. And so you know the board can say, well, having a little chunk here and a little chunk there and a little chunk here doesn't meet that requirement. 
Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm looking for, though, are also the offsetting incentives that would still, while we could tighten up those aesthetic things, they would also offer some incentive to continue with the PRD rather than saying, oh, to heck with it, I'm going to do a subdivision. Mm. Because that, that's what we're up against, mm -hmm. right, at every, at every juncture. So I think that that's why I was intrigued by, like, the dead-end street thing. Yeah, if we have a subdivision, we're not going to have a dead-end street. So, I mean, we've already been around that uh, block recently, um, so, so to speak. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if there are ways in which we can make things more attractive and yet get what we want out of it, um, I think that we should look at that so i think we should look at both sides of it tightening but also incenting yeah uh, and and so in terms of and you said the same thing i think on the the energy uh rate. yeah energy yeah um and and so what what is the what, what are you thinking in terms of incentive incentives um i mean there's there's increased density right um and it's interesting when you offer increased density, but then require more open space. So you're really saying, pack them in. That's you know? right. Well, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, you know, up. pack them in, build them up. We're talking yeah, about exactly. now what, you know, the, what Alan was showing. Yeah. Well, and I think that's an interesting thing. I think I we should too. look at that. I absolutely I, do. I absolutely do. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so the flip side of that, though, is that if you think about that, then you also need to think about changing that it has to be um, compatible with the neighborhood because yeah. n nowhere are you going to get Three anybody story. who currently has mm -hmm. you know a, a colonial or a cape and you have a three-story yes. complex next to I don't to know them. what that means compatible with the neighborhood I mean, well really it's always language? subjective it is a, it is a subjective I mean property, it, it right. Is, right exactly like I, I would say but like even so a, true to the an excellent example of a colonial is good with an excellent example of a modern structure rather than like a cruddy colonial and like a great colonial. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, but it's it's really more as... <laughs> but I would be in favor of loosening the... I don't know. Is there a like room this, full of people with pitchforks and flaming torches? Right. Okay. No, you're right. <laughs> then you can sort of say it's not compatible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's usually yes. the criteria. I don't, Matt, I'm, I'm with you in wanting to keep thinking about PRDs <laughs> and torches. how and whether they're... Whether the, we can can't get more out of it. I mean, I know I've been yeah. so I'm with you. Um, it may just be a tweak, you know, it yeah. may only literally be some it. sentences in this thing. I think but. it's harder to think about getting there than it was with the accessory and the, the yeah. family, but I think we should keep doing it. Okay. But that's just my. Okay. So. I think we have some, some resolutions here then. Um, and I, I think that oh, we'll... Oh, good. No, well, first of all, there, no village PRD, right? Yeah. Okay. So I got no that one. PRD. Okay. And then I think uh, that on still the... Still looking at the existing PRD. Existing uh, PRD. PRD and I think that this, the pieces that we want to look at are, first of all, uh, tightening up the open space requirements, uh, perhaps uh, allowing inc bonus incentives for additional open space um, and then per perhaps a, a bonus incentive for um, more energy efficiency. Those are the main ones, right? I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I know this has come before is, this is probably more tied to, to the aesthetics is the garage issue so that we don't yeah have ones well that are do we that limit to garages linked garages and stuff like that car barns garages quick yeah. is there anything we can do has i mean i don't know what you could practically do but i'd love to find a way to do it to to, to limit what? the number of garages somehow or parking format yeah well, yeah, so currently the zoning bylaw requires two parking spaces per residential unit. So you can say in, in a PRD, a maximum of one and a half space per unit and let them decide how they, you can, you can, you can say yeah. maximum. I see. More and more communities are yeah, looking doing at parking, parking maximums, maximums, not parking minimums. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the way so to go. So you can look at a parking maximum. But is it, those, are the, 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 those three things would be... There would be a big improvement to 
yeah. make a pretty sizable difference. And, so, and, yeah. and a, a parking a parking maximum. Yeah. Yeah. And I could see that being, I, I have a little bit of concern tying energy efficiency to a, a density bonus. Um, because I, the density bonus directly affects the external aesthetics that the neighbors and the, the you know, whether it's yeah. in the neighborhood. Energy is a goal that we have. But, but if you're tying, uh, let's say you get, you get to go to just hypothetically 12 units per acre but then you're restricted to a parking maximum of, of some number, then you're reducing the, the visual surface, you're reducing yeah. the visual bulk. Yeah. Like those two things I think could maybe work pretty well together. And, and we've, heard, we've heard from more than one developer, well, two car garages are required. It's not economically feasible. Well, maybe it's economically feasible if you get to build two extra units. Yeah. Well, and I think that it will incent people to build the kind of units that the our housing production needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you may get a bonus density for having, you know, less parking spaces. Yeah. And yeah. provide some alternative transportation, or the PRD joins Crosstown Connect, and they provide a little, you know, shuttle stop or something. But Burton, uh, back to the, the energy efficiency. I mean, I, I understand the concern, but I'm also wondering how else could we incent it? Um, I'm thinking. I, you <laughs> could make a PRD get site plan approval. Site plan approval, but currently site plan approval is not required for a PRD. Okay. Well, I think that would—that's a straightforward thing to add. Either that or or look to have, so it, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to just like you did with site plan criteria add a sustainability uh, criteria because there's many different special permits that you, you never ever see that mm -hmm. the board of appeals sees. Yeah, you can't you know somebody who you know, gets a special permit for an outdoor event you know they're not going to have a site plan criteria for syst you know sustainability. Yeah. But for site plan approval, for a, you know, if a PRD requires site plan approval, you already have the sustainability criteria. Right. Well, why don't we? I just don't. Add I don't know that. I don't know the history of, of why. Why it doesn't? It doesn't, and it could be um, timing. I don't know when site plan was first adopted. If this was adopted in the early '70s, it it may have just not been. Part of the bylaw and it never nobody yeah, ever thought never to, thought to it. put it right or fit it they'd always already been doing a few of them um and you wanted to add also uh elizabeth that discussion of whether the zba does an approval at all of a prd so so i think that's a, a, a Another, topic of discussion with yeah. the board of appeals but shouldn't we bring it up with the select board as well when we meet with them i mean mentioned we've got now this laundry list of like five things that we're going to look at for the prd i think that we should add that as yep. we're going to look at that. Okay. I mean, we don't have any final decisions yet on the PRD at all, but, uh, okay. I think that that, I'm a, I'm a little surprised where we ended up, but I think that was useful. Okay. Uh, then I think that leads us to public comment or actually any liaison reports first. Anybody no. go to any meetings? No. I did. I went to the CPC, but I did nothing. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Nothing to report Nothing yet. To report back to it gets exciting in December. Uh, may I, um, at some point, we <coughs> relating to hats, um, we were going to look into whether Lincoln was having a problem with their accessory um, drawing. Did, did we ever touch base with the Lincoln Town Planner? No, I'll, I'll make myself another note. Thanks. Okay. All right, then now we're ready for public comment. Any general public comment this evening? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a great job right? State your name and address. <laughs> 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 One more thing for Nancy to type. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, thanks very much, and the meeting's adjourned.